Let's begin reading here in Ephesians chapter 3. We'll begin at verse 1. I'm going to take you through verses 1 through 13 today. And uh, we'll begin by looking at verses 1 through 7, and then we'll move on into uh, verse 13. So beginning at verse 1 in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul writes, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. So the first 13 verses here in Ephesians chapter 3 are an introduction to a prayer that Paul is about to pray for them. Now notice how he prefaces his prayer. He prefaces his prayer with a reminder to them concerning what they already have in Jesus Christ. He also wants them to realize that God's grace has placed them in his body, the church. So these verses that we're looking at are intended to reemphasize what he's already written to them, and this would help them to understand the things that he was about to pray for. Now, he'd been saying that the Jew and the Gentile have been made one in Christ. So because of this, there's no longer any spiritual distinction being made between Jew and Gentile. In Ephesians 2.13, he had written, In Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 2, verse 19, he said, You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So making such a claim was immense. And I've been sharing this with you. Let me repeat it. Uh, making such a claim that the Jew and the Gentile would be one in Jesus Christ is an immense claim. Because Jews had no dealings with the Gentiles. When you read your Bible, you look at the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 21, that chapter records how, how Paul had been accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple. And to do such a thing was, was called defiling the temple, and it was punishable by death. In 1871, two archaeologists, a man named Clermont and the other Gano, discovered what is known as the Soric inscription is a sign that warns non-Jews to keep out of the temple area. And this is what the sign says. I've said it before, but bears repetition. No foreigner is to enter the barriers surrounding the sanctuary. He who is caught will have himself to blame for his death, which will follow. And so they were pretty serious. If you were a Gentile, you could go to a certain area. It was called the Court of the Gentiles, but you can't go any further. You can't go any further than that outer court. And so if you were to proceed into the court of the women or the court of the men or the court of the priests, if you were to proceed or try to get further on, you would be put to death. It was punishable by death. And so Paul had been accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple in chapter 21 of Acts. In Acts 21, 31, it reads that they were seeking to kill him because he was being accused of bringing Gentiles, but Paul had been rescued by soldiers. In Acts 21, 35, when Paul had reached the steps after such a commotion had taken place, the violence of the mob was so great that he had to be carried by the soldiers. But he asked to make a defense, and he said, may I have permission to speak to these people? And it was granted to him, and he began to speak to them in Hebrew. And when he began to speak to them in Hebrew, it calmed them down for a while, and he began to make his defense. And he began by giving his testimony. And as he gave his testimony, the, uh, this angry mob, because he's speaking in Hebrew, uh, they quieted down and, and began to listen to the things that he had to say. But when he got to the place where he said that he had been sent to the Gentiles, the mood changed. The Bible says in Acts 22, verse 22, they listened to him up to this statement. And then they raised their voices and said, away with such a, a man from the earth, he should not be allowed to live. 
That happens to me every Sunday. And so <laughs> the separation was so great that Paul had to make it clear to these Gentiles, these Ephesians, Gentiles, you have access to God. He had said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, that, that we have, as Gentiles, we've been adopted as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. In chapter 2, verse 18, he said, through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So this revelation is so wonderful that Paul has to remind them of what he has said. And that's why he begins this chapter in verse 1 by saying, for this reason, for this reason. As mentioned, this is the introduction to the prayer that he's beginning to pray in verse 14. But before he prays, he reminds the Ephesians, interestingly enough, of his ministry credentials. He also reminds them of some of the spiritual truths that he's already shared with them. And so just by thinking of that for a moment, I decided to, to share these kinds of things. Why is it necessary for him to repeat himself? There are those who would say, I've heard that before. Can't you say something fresh or something new? Why is it necessary to repeat yourself? Why did, why did Paul know that it was necessary to say, I've already said that. I just said this. Let me say it again. Why does he have to do that? It's obvious because we don't get it the first time we hear it. For us to learn, we often must hear some things many times. You know, I can't tell you how many times... Uh, I have, because I, I, I go to many services, obviously the church services here, and I hear the worship. I can't tell you how many times I forget the words in the songs. I can't tell you how many times. Why? Because I'm old? Yeah. <laughs> things have to be repeated to me. And I'm assuming that that would be true with all of us. So if we have this idea that the first time we hear it, we get it, we're wrong. Things have to be repeated, sometimes several times so that we finally get to understand the emphasis of it and begin to plumb the depths of what we're hearing. And for us to learn, we have to hear some things many times. That's because, again, we don't always understand what we're hearing the first time. You see, spiritual truths are often revealed slowly and repeated often. The most obvious spiritual revelation relates to Jesus' death and resurrection. I'll give you this as an example. As we've been going through Mark, we've seen this. You'll see this again this upcoming Sunday. But from the beginning of his ministry, Jesus had spoken concerning uh, this, uh, his resurrection more than once. We, we saw that in John 2, 19, when his ministry had begun, he had said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He spoke of the resurrection of his body. I had pointed out in Matthew 12, verse 40, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So he's repeating himself. He's saying it more than once. Peter makes this great confession. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And after he makes that confession, Jesus once again begins to share more about the resurrection. In Matthew's account in chapter 16, verse 21, uh, Matthew writes, From that time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and be raised the third day. But he repeats that in Matthew 17, 22, and 23. He repeats that in Matthew 20, verses 17 through 19. He repeats and repeats and repeats. He says it over and over and over again. In John's gospel, in chapter 10, verse 17, he said this. He said, my father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it again. Over and over and over again, the central, the core thing related to our faith, the resurrection, the crucifixion, burial, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the core of our faith is repeated over and over and over again. Why? Because he will repeat a single truth numerous times so that we might understand. And so even though Jesus repeated this truth various times, he was still misunderstood. And again, some things aren't understood the first time that we hear it. So one of the responsibilities of a teacher is to faithfully remind people of the truth of God. And that's most effectively done through the faithful teaching of God's word. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, Paul, uh, Peter said it like this, I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside 
as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. How did you go about doing that, Peter? I wrote first and second, Peter, so that you would remember these things. So that's how the Lord teaches us. And so Paul has just said something, but he's going to reiterate. He's going to repeat. He's going to say it again. And with that in mind, he reminds them. And he reminds them of his ministry credentials, and he reminds them of his teaching. Now, notice how he begins again. He begins by identifying himself. Verse 1, chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. He begins by identifying himself as a prisoner, notice, of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul had been placed in prison by Rome. But even though Rome had imprisoned him, notice he didn't say, Paul, a prisoner of Rome. He said, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He's not a prisoner of Rome. He's saying, though I am in jail, I'm still free. I'm free in Christ because God is in control of my life. It's been said, we can take away a man's liberty, but we can never take away his freedom. And when you're free in Jesus Christ, no matter where you are, you're always free. And that's what Paul is pointing to. He's in jail. He's a prisoner. And yet he's free in Christ because God is in control of his life. In 2 Timothy, he had said in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he said, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal, but God's word is not chained. And so he had freedom. He was in jail, but he saw this and continued to see that as an opportunity to minister the word of God. In Philippians, in chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, he said, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest, that my chains are in Christ. So he had an opportunity because the, uh, the guards who were, who were there to, to guard him would be, often would be chained to him. Can you imagine that? They'd have to have a shift where they were there chained to the Apostle Paul. What do you think he spoke about? And they couldn't get away. They were his prisoner. They couldn't get away. And he had the chance to speak to all of the guards. And many of them came to faith in Jesus Christ because he didn't see his captivity as being a detriment, but an opportunity. He saw where I am at, I can be used by God. Sometimes we, we get upset because we may have a job that we don't like. One, we should be grateful we have a job. But maybe we get upset because we have a job that we don't like. And we fail to realize that that's the job we prayed for. As I recall, there were times I'd say, oh, God, I need this job. Oh, God, I need this job. Then I got this job. Oh, God, I hate this job. I hate this job, right? I got to get out of here. And, and, and yet here's the, here's the Lord. He could speak to my heart, your heart, and say, but this is what you asked for. You prayed for this. And when I gave it to you, you rejoiced. And what, now because it's difficult, you want to leave? No, look at your, at your time there as your opportunity there, that God will open up doors for you to share. Because who knows but that, that person that you're working next to that you may not care much about or that boss that uh, seems to be so difficult sometimes. Who knows but that you might have been sent there for the purpose of being a testimony to that person. Like when Paul and Silas were placed in jail in Philippi and uh, they had been beaten, they had been placed in stocks and, and the scripture says at midnight they were singing songs to God and the prisoners heard them. And that's when the Philippian jailer came and, and, and uh, had a conversation with, with them and wanted to know how... How, how can I be saved? And, and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved in your house. That was their opportunity and they rejoiced at that opportunity. And so Paul is not a prisoner of Rome. He's, he's a prisoner on behalf of the Gentiles. He's had an opportunity 
uh, and will have opportunities to bring forth the gospel to those who perhaps have never heard the word of God. And so he's preaching the gospel to Gentiles. That's his ministry calling. When he was writing to the, the church of Galatia in chapter 2, verse 7, he said, the gospel for the uncircumcised has been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. So he knew his calling was to minister to the Gentiles. And so he's speaking concerning that. And he says it. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, verse 2, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. And so if you have heard of the dispensation, that word dispensation is a word that speaks of management. It, it, it speaks of managing a business, uh, managing a household. It, it speaks of being a steward or managing the affairs of someone else. And so the manager, the one who had this dispensation, uh, was the one who had responsibilities for, for everything, for the planting of seed, for the harvesting of the seed, for the storing of the seed, for preparing meals, for bookkeeping. And, and they had responsibilities. And, and he uses that word to speak of himself when he speaks of, again in verse 2, of the dispensation of the grace of God that he has that was given to him for these Gentiles. He is a household manager is what he's saying. I'm a steward. I'm a steward of the grace of God. So what happens is God gifts us, and we are to take care of those gifts, those ministries, those skills, and that knowledge, and we're to use those things uh, when given opportunity. We, we speak to those who, who can benefit from the gospel. We minister to those who have a need, and, and that's what we do, and we're caretakers, all of us in this room. If you're saved, every one of us has been entrusted with gifts and uh, opportunities. And what we do as believers is we take opportunities as they're given to us and use them for the glory of God. Now, I haven't always been a pastor of a church. I, I got saved at 20 and when in the military, got out, started going to school, started a Bible study and various things, worked jobs, got married. I wasn't a pastor when I got married. Marie and I, uh, we went to church, we served in church, but I wasn't a pastor in a church. And yet I used the opportunities that God gave to me, whether as a college student or whether as an employee, to, to when given opportunity to share the gospel and, and speak to the people that, that were there and about Jesus. And, and no, you know, sometimes you hear these stories of these, from these guys that talk about how they did these things and how God always moved through them. And that's not, that wasn't true for me. Wasn't true for me at all. I got people uptight sometimes. They got mad. And, you know, it, uh, I didn't always have a, uh, you know, uh, they didn't always come to Jesus. Sometimes they wanted to send me to Jesus. They didn't. <laughs> They didn't necessarily always come to Jesus, but I, I saw it as opportunity. See, and this is something I'd like to bestow on you, something to think about, pray about, and perhaps even practice, and it is this. If it's not you, then who? If it's not you, then who? Who's going to share? You're going to pray, oh, God, send somebody? What if God says, I did, I sent you? No, no, I'm talking about somebody else. It's kind of like Isaiah in the year that King Isaiah died. I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up, and its train filled the temple. And there was glory, and the seraphim were crying out, holy, holy, holy. And then he said, then I realized that I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. And, 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 and a coal was placed on my lip, and then I was sent forth. And what I had said is he, he was saying, I saw the Lord. But he finally says, here am I, Lord, because God says, who will go for us? Here am I, Lord. Send me. Have you ever thought about that yourself? Here am I, Lord. Send me. Well, no. A lot of people say, there he is, Lord. <laughs> Send him. The adventure of faith that so many of us fail to enjoy until it's very late. You could have had such a blast serving God. But we put it off and put it off and we put it off until we're finally just burned out and hardly anything to offer anymore? No, get used by the Lord now. Make yourself available to God now. Ask God to use you now. Now, if he tells you, I'm not ready to use you, well, bless the Lord, I'm ready. I've got my glove, I've got my cleats, I'm ready to play, put me in. But if he says, I'm going to put you on the bench for a while because you've got to learn some things, then you sit the bench. When I was 10 years old, I was put on a baseball team 
And I used to chew the edge of my glove, you know. I had the uniform. But I, in, in 22 games, I played 10 innings. 22 games. They sat me. And I was so frustrated because I didn't want to sit there in a clean uniform. I wanted to play and get that uniform dirty. I wanted to play. So I learned a long time ago, sometimes you sit the bench before you're on the field. And if you wait for the Lord to teach you the things that are necessary to learn on the bench, you learn your lesson, he puts you in. And when he puts you in, then you find the place you were supposed to be all along, but you were prepared for that. Paul knew that he was sent to be a minister to the Gentiles. Peter had received a ministry to the Jew, but he said, I have been sent to the uncircumcised. The Ephesians were people who were recipients of that particular gifting that God had given to him, and he knew that that was what he had been called to do. He said, this dispensation has been given to me. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, each of you, he says, should, be, should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And so he speaks of that. He says, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. In verse 3, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. The word revelation, it's the way he's speaking of God uh, communicating truth to him. He's making it clear, this revelation didn't come from other men. This revelation is not the wisdom of other men. This revelation is from God. This revelation is from the Spirit of God. It's like Galatians 1.12 where he says, I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10, he says, God revealed it to us by the Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. And so God had, through the Holy Spirit, giving him a revelation. And notice in verse 3, by revelation, he said, he made, uh, he made known to me the mystery. Again, I've shared this with you, but it bears repetition for just a moment. The word mystery is used in a different way in the Greek and the Bible, and it is that we use it in the way that we use it today. Uh, my wife, Marie, likes mysteries, you know, mystery shows and this and that. You know, she likes them. You know, mysteries are usually just things that are hard to find out. How do you find Well, the biblical... Uh, definition of mystery is that which at one time had been hidden that is now revealed. That's what the word mystery speaks of, that which at one time had been hidden but is now revealed. And that's what Paul is speaking about here when he speaks of the secrets of God. They're the secrets of God that have been hidden from those who don't know him, the ungodly, but they are the secrets that have been revealed to those who know him, also called those who are godly. And so God had revealed a mystery to Paul. And what was that mystery? That Jew and Gentile are one in Jesus Christ. This mystery was, up until the church age, hidden from men. The mystery that the gospel would give Gentiles access to God had been hidden. And he says that he had briefly written about this. He says, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So that refers again to what he's already been writing, especially in chapter 1. Let me read it to you in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, where he said, Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. And then in chapter 2, in verse 11 through 13, again, therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, 
having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And that's what he's talking about. This is the ministry that at one time had been hidden, but has now been revealed. And that's why he says, as, as he's writing in verse 4, that's why he says, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge. Now, I'm going to develop this with you a little bit too. Because the word knowledge there, I, I, I looked it up in the original language and commentators are pointing to it, so I did my own research on it just to make sure what I'm saying to you is true. That word knowledge is, is uh, not the kind of knowledge that you, uh, you gain particularly through you endeavoring to gather it yourself. It, it's something that the Spirit gives you which would be really a spiritual insight. So when you read, you may understand my insight is literally what he's saying. My insight, he's saying, is spiritual. So I have a zeal, he's saying. And it's not just, uh, just a zeal. It's a zeal for you. It's a zeal for the gospel. It's a zeal that I have because God has given it to me. And I want you to know the source. I'm not just an excitable man, but I'm moved by a deep and spiritual insight that God has given to me. You know, there are those of us who have excitable personalities. I, I happen to enjoy those with excitable personalities. It's a lot of fun to be around. You know, excited, people who are excitable. It's better to have someone around you go, ah, than to have somebody who's, you know, it's just, you know. So I, I, I like people who get, you know, are, are, are into what they're doing. You know, when I used to play ball a long time ago now, um, I never wanted to be on a team with someone who was bored. You know, let's go out there and, and let's play hard. Let's enjoy the game. Let's, let's just, but if, if you're there, oh, I... Go sit on the bench, drink, you know, have a snow cone, do something, but don't be on the, you know, don't, don't, don't do that. See, so he said, I want you to know the source of my, my, my excitement. Uh, it, it's not some fleshly excitement because when we have fleshly excitement, even in things of the Lord, when it's fleshly excitement, it usually wears off. It wears off. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't go out there and, 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 provoke people to emotional excitement because emotional excitement wears off. What he wants is the depth so that the excitement you have is, is built on a solid foundation. And so he's not just an excitable man, but he's moved by deep spiritual insights. Uh, one of the things that you might find interesting that he had to defend himself uh, against one of the charges, and you see this in the book of 2 Corinthians. I encourage you to read that uh, that book, and, and you will find that no less than 22 times Paul defends himself against accusations. No less than 22 times. It is one of the most open-hearted books. It is the most open-hearted book that Paul writes. It's my favorite book to teach pastors. It's my favorite book because from chapter 1 to the end of the book, he defends himself against charges. Various charges. He's in it for the money. He's not anointed. He sure is ugly. Various <laughs> charges. And you'll see that when you read that. You know, his words are weighty, but his presence is weak. You know, They say things about Paul, and he, because these, um, these false teachers had infiltrated the church of Corinth and began to steal the hearts of the people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, Though you may have 10,000 instructors, Yet ye have but one Father, I begot you in the gospel. When he's speaking to the Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, he said, like a father who has espoused his virgin daughter to a man, I feel like your father, and I want to protect your purity. Because these infiltrators had entered into the church and were undermining his ministry. They were saying things about this great man of God from chapter 1 all the way to almost the conclusion of the book. If you read it, you will see the things that he's saying are actually a defense of himself because of the assassination of his character that went on through these Corinthian infiltrators. And every church, every church that has a pastor that is trying to do the will of the Lord will always have people on the outside saying, he's in it for this, he's in it for that. Everyone does. They all do. Because there will always be people trying to undermine it. And one of the things they said about him is that he was crazy. 
In 2 Corinthians 5.13, he said, if we are out of our mind, as some say, it's for God. If we are in our right mind, it's for you. And so those were accusations. That was one. He wasn't just somebody who was emotional. He was someone who was moved. And his zeal was the product of God moving in him. It was the product of God giving to him insight into the things of the kingdom. And, and that's what he's sharing with them. So he says, again in verse 4, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge, my insights in the mystery of Christ. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, but has now been revealed. So Paul intends not only to speak of the mystery, but to clarify it and explain it. And it's his intent to not only disclose it, but he wants them to understand Again, that's the heart of a minister, not just to give information, but to give information that people grasp, understand, and their lives are changed by. And that's what his desire is, is for, they must, for them to know that. He says, notice in verse 5 that this was a mystery not, not made known to the sons of men as it has now been. In time past, it was not completely revealed. That's what he's saying. No one fully realized, for example, that that Abraham was the father of many nations. They didn't realize that, though Genesis 17, 4 makes that clear. Uh, no one completely understood Isaiah's words in Isaiah 49, 6, where it reads, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. They didn't fully understand that either. These are still mysteries. So God used Paul to reveal this truth, preaching both to Jew and Gentile the grace of God. In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 1, verse 24, he said, but to those who are, but those called by God to salvation, both, he says, Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. To both the Jew and the Gentile, this mystery has been made known. In verse 6, here's your mystery, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. They are fellow heirs of the same body. They are partakers, he says, of his promise. Now, we just read that in chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. They once were far off, but now are regarded as equal to Jewish believers. That was completely unheard of. That they would be equal to a Jewish Christian? Well, in Galatians 3.29, it says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. You are equal. And I'm telling you, they, they needed to hear that more than once. Because their tradition of hundreds of years, centuries that there was a separation between Jew and Gentile to the degree, as I mentioned earlier, that should a Gentile wander into forbidden areas of the temple, that they, were, they would be put to death. It was that strong so that the apostle Peter, when even commanded by God to go to the house of a, of a Gentile, and, and, and you remember that, it's in Acts 10, how how that the sheep descended while he uh, sheet descended while he was there, and and he sees that it has all manner of animals and creeping things, and then hears the the voice of the Lord saying, "Rise, uh, rise up, slay and eat." No, no, he says, "No, Lord, no, 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 no. I'm kosher. I, I I've never eaten anything unclean. You know that story. I'm kosher." I, I have never eaten something like that. It's unclean. Don't say what, don't call something unclean that I have declared to be clean, God says to him. And that vision repeats three times. And then there's three Gentiles downstairs there waiting for him. And he starts perceiving. They take him to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile. And he says, I perceive that God is not a respecter of persons. You know it is not lawful for a man of Israel, a Jew, to have any kind of dealings with Gentiles. But God showed me that what he calls to be clean, I am not to call unclean, you see? 
And yet later on, Paul has to rebuke him because before certain people came who were Jews, Peter had been eating with Gentiles. But when they came, he distanced himself. And Paul said, I had to address him to his face in front of witnesses because he was stumbling people with his hypocrisy. So it was a strong thing, something that we really don't have the a, a same understanding of, but that's what's so revolutionary here in the book of Ephesians. You, he's saying, are of the same body. He says in verse 6, you are partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. And his promises are those various blessings that he has been speaking of. In 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. These promises are fulfilled through Jesus is what he's saying. And he moves on in verse 7, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. The gospel is shared by those whom God has called to proclaim it. Paul knew that God by grace had given him the honor and privilege of sharing the gospel. So both the calling to proclaim it and the empowering originated with God. And he's saying, I know the calling and the power comes from God, and it is simply my privilege to be able to serve him. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, he said it like this in chapter 15, verse 10. He said, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. When I grew up, I used to watch Popeye, and every time I read 1 Corinthians 15, 10, I'm sorry, I think of Popeye, I am what I am, that's all that I am. So when I read that, by the grace of God, I am what I am, well, that's what he is. By his grace, I am who I am, and I do what I do. In Colossians 1, 28 and 29, he says, Him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. I am attempting to proclaim this message to everybody, but I am not striving in the flesh, I am working through the energies of the Spirit. Just because you may have a burden, the burden that you may have does not always mean that it's a call. I've shared this with, with pastoral candidates, with people who, who want to serve the Lord in full-time ministry. And sometimes they'll have this idea that they want to go to a certain place and do a certain thing and all of that. And when you ask them why, well, I just have a burden. Well, a burden isn't the call. There needs to be a sense of leading. There needs to be a confirmation, not only the internal witness, but also through, through a group of people that you respect who love the Lord, who pray for you and encourage you and are listening on your behalf and seeing that the Lord may speak to their hearts in a certain way. And should they say, yes, you know what, I, I think you ought to go, then there's another witness, and that is a witness of a congregation. Because you may have an internal witness, a desire. You may have other people saying, you know what, you're a great communicator, go for it. And then you open up your Bible and you try to speak, and nobody hangs around. And maybe you're not called. Maybe that is your calling. You know, it's not that numbers always demonstrate a, a sure calling, but fruit does. And when there are people that are coming and saying, I can hear this and I want to grow, and this helps me to know Jesus better, that may be a confirmation. But just because somebody has an energy in the flesh doesn't mean that that energy is the spirit. And that's why, uh, and I was just sharing this with somebody more than once. This has come up just this week. And I said, you know, in my personal life as a minister, the number one thing that, that I rely on is, is besides, obviously, the word of God and, and all but it is, the, is, is prayer. Just because I might think something needs to be done doesn't mean I'm the one who's supposed to do that. So I ask the Lord. I say, Father, I see this, and I'm, and I'm waiting. I've had this many times. I'm waiting on somebody else to do this, and nobody does. And eventually the burden never uh, leaves me, and then 
then I'll then I'll go and take a step of faith and and then I discover that's exactly what the Lord wanted. And so he he knows that he doesn't do things in the energy of the flesh and and he knows that he's not doing this because there's something inside of him that just pushes him at his fleshly. It's the Holy Spirit that has given to him this prompting. He says to me, verse eight, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. These are the words of a very thankful man. These are the words of someone who has been forgiven much. You know, there are those that I can tell you I've been at, at, at in ministry for a long time, and I can tell you I've, I've read, you know, I've, I've read a lot of different books and materials and things over the years, and and there have been those who have said, Paul, Paul was a very, was, he seriously had doubts and had self-esteem problems. And then they point to the scripture in verse 8 here in Ephesians 3 as a proof text. Notice how he says to me who am less than the least of all the saints. See, he, he didn't know who he was in Christ. That's nonsense. This is the voice of a humble man. Yeah, humility is something that today is probably missing in quite a number of us, but this is the voice of a humble man. You have that woman who enters into that room, my, one of my favorite portions of Scripture in Luke 7, and she's looking around a room until she, she sees Jesus, and, and with emotion she approaches him there as he's reclining at meal, and she stands over his feet as his feet are out, his elbow is resting and his feet are away from the table and, and she starts to weep and, and as she's weeping, her tears begin to splash on his dusty feet and she kneels down and she begins to take her hair down and, and dry his feet with, and, and she kisses the feet and Simon, who had invited him, says, if this man truly were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him for she's a sinner. Simon, a self-righteous Pharisee who had invited Jesus Christ not to receive from him the blessings of things of the kingdom, but rather to judge him. This man's not a prophet because he wouldn't let something like that touch him. She's a sinner. She was well known in the city of being immoral. And Jesus says, Simon, I have something to ask you. Well, say it. What do you want to ask me? He said there were two men, two men who owed another man. One owed him a great sum and the other a lesser sum, but the man completely forgave both of them. Simon, my question is, who's going to love him most? Well, I suppose the one that has been forgiven the most. And he's, then this is, this is what I love about this passage, how it says, and Jesus said, do you see this woman? See, that to me is very important because a lot of times we don't see people. We just see that she's a such because that's what Simon had said, such as these. He called her a such. He didn't even look at her as a human being. You see this woman. You know, let, let's, let's take those hypocritical eyeglasses off for just a moment, Simon, and take a moment to look at this woman. Take a moment to look at this woman. You didn't give me the basic greeting that should be given to every man because the man who comes into your house as a guest, you give him a kiss. You didn't kiss me. You didn't even uh, take the time to, uh, to uh, anoint my hair. And you didn't take the time to do the basic things that, that are just you know normal courtesies. But this woman, she, she, she has wept and she has washed my feet with her tears. And, and let me tell you something, Simon. The one who has been forgiven much, loves much. How much have I been forgiven? Sometimes people look at me, and I hear it, so I'll say it. They say, you know, can't you, can't you give a Bible study without tearing up? And I wish I could. I'm going to do it tonight. <laughs> but when I start thinking of what I was and what he's done, I was teaching at a pastor's conference recently and one of the pastors had made fun of me there were, were friends had made fun of me for crying 
And so when I taught, I said, you know, I said, it's the question isn't why do I cry? The question is, why don't you? Because have you been forgiven much? I have. Are you thankful? I am. When I consider the blessings, the goodness, the joy, how can you not shed a tear of gratitude for what God has done, right? And Paul had that. And he makes it very clear. This is humility. People aren't used to seeing it. This is a man who knew he needed the grace of God. In 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, this is what he says. He said, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. No, when he says that, he realizes who he was, and God had given him a mission, and that mission was to preach among the Gentiles, verse 8, the unsearchable riches of Christ. The word unsearchable means beyond tracing, the inability to find something out completely, the unfathomable. He's saying, I am to proclaim the incredible depth of God's grace towards undeserving sinners. I preach, I preach his mercy, I preach his compassion, I preach his love, his kindness, his generosity, I, I preach his patience, and I preach his glory. And these are things that we're unable to actually grasp. But they're ours because we have them in Jesus. In Romans eleven thirty three, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, his ways, past finding out. In Colossians 1, 27, to them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says in verse 9, he says, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. To make all people see what is the fellowship, that word fellowship again, is a word that can be translated the administration or dispensation or the stewardship. My call is to make all people see. When he says to make all people see, to bring to light. My call is to bring to light that God makes the Jew and the Gentile one in Christ. And this offer is contained in the message of salvation revealed to us by the gospel. He says in verse 9, he goes, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created everything. God's work of salvation through Christ is to be known by all. In the end, all will realize that God designed the church to include all who would believe. Jew and Gentile are intended to live at peace, and Jew and Gentile are intended to worship the same God. And this was made possible by the message and reception of the gospel. Again, in Ephesians 2.15, he said, having abolished in his flesh... The enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Notice verse 9, from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus. This mystery from the beginning has had been formed, but had not been known. And God has created, notice, all things through Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.16 says it like this, In him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and visible, whether thrones or powers or rulers, authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. All things would include the plan of salvation, the plan that included both the Gentiles and the Jew. He says in verse 10, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now that's interesting how he puts that. When he speaks concerning the manifold wisdom, the manifold wisdom of God speaks of the various ways that his ministry is shown. So God has brought forth the church, and in doing so manifested his wisdom before all. And verse 10 says that would include angelic principalities and powers. This is interesting to, to point out for a moment. Angels don't understand salvation. 
Angels don't understand salvation. Why? Because the angels that fell remain fallen. They're never redeemed. The angels who did not fall wouldn't understand what failure and grace is. They are ministering spirits who are sent by God to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. Sometimes people will say, yeah, so-and-so died and he's now an angel. Don't, don't be one who says that. Because that's biblically incorrect. And a lot of times I read that on Facebook in the purveyor of all false doctrine. I had somebody writing me from Facebook who wanted to argue with me that Satan could be redeemed. Yeah. I haven't read the Bible because in the book of Revelation it points out very, very clearly that he ends up in the lake of fire. So no, he's never redeemed. And so what you're doing is you're misunderstanding scripture and you're emotionally kind of presenting it. But in fact, you're wrong and he wouldn't take correction. So, angels don't understand. There's an interesting scripture. It's found in the book of Luke, chapter 15, verse 10, where it says there is joy in the presence of the angels of God when a sinner repents. We all know that. Very often, you'll hear somebody giving an invitation, and they'll say, right now, there is joy because people got saved. I've heard people, again, they write that. That's not, it. That's not a correct interpretation of that. If you look at the scripture, it says there is joy in the presence of the angels of God. The angels aren't rejoicing. It's God. It's God who has recovered his lost sheep. It's God who has got the lost son. It's God who rejoices. Not the angels. Why? Because the angels don't understand salvation. How do I know that? Well, scripture is very clear about that. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 it was revealed to them, the prophets, that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. They don't understand. They don't understand salvation. And so this salvation is intended to be a display before angelic principalities and powers. The bringing forth of the church is intended to bring glory to the God who created it. In Psalm 103, verse 22, Bless the Lord, all his works and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. In verse 11, According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. His eternal purpose was salvation of man, again, including Jew and Gentile, verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him, because we have a relationship to God through Jesus Christ, we now have freedom of speech, freedom of access, and a confidence in salvation. In Hebrews 4.16, the writer said, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You know, before you got saved, you might have prayed once in a while, and then you thought that your prayers were just going as far as your voice would carry and then falling to the earth, unheard and, and unanswered. But you don't have to have that anymore. Because you know why? Because we have access to God through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by him, so we go through him. That's why people have the habit, including myself, of saying in the name of Jesus, by his authority, I can approach the throne of grace to obtain mercy in my time of need. Because Jesus Christ has made it possible. I, who was dead in trespasses and sins, have made, been made alive by the Spirit of God. I am now no longer a, a, a child of disobedience. I am now a son of God himself. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even unto those who believe in his name. I believe in his name. I've given my heart to Christ. I am his child. And as a son, I can approach my father and I can say, Father, I have a need. And that came through Jesus Christ. That, be, that didn't come by works of righteousness that I've done, but according to his mercy, by his grace. And that's you too. We can approach him that way. We can approach the throne of God and we can obtain uh, mercy and find grace in our time of need. And then finally, he says in verse 13, therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. Don't pity me. 
because of the suffering that I've gone through. Don't pity me because of the fact that I'm in jail. I don't want your sympathy. And I don't want you to be sad. You see, my framework is larger than a jail cell. My, my framework is longer than a lifetime. My framework is eternity. And the place that I will dwell is with Christ in heaven. So why are you pitying me? I don't want, and that's what he's saying. I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation for you, which is, he says, your glory. I am willing to go through this if you're set free. I'm willing to do this. I want you to know that I'm not going through anything. I'm just preparing for something greater. In Romans 8, verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And in 1 Peter 5, verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. And again, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Don't pity me. Don't feel sad for me, he's saying. I'm going through this, but I know where I'm going, and I'm going through this in part for your sake, so that you might know the things of God. That is Paul's heart, the heart of a shepherd. I am willing to do whatever I need to do if you walk away knowing Jesus better. That's the key. And so he says, do not lose heart of my tribulation. This is really going to result in your glory. What a beautiful man the Apostle Paul is. What a beautiful man. Our Father, we ask that you would work within us.